Hello and welcome to LetMeBoreYouToSleep.com My name is Jason Newland and this is Let Me Bore You To Sleep. I think it's 145. So that's how many episodes there's been. That's quite a lot, isn't it, really? And so, yeah... Please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes. And just let you know, uh, I was wondering why Andre had moved his bag. So he's got a bag that he sleeps in. He knows I'm talking about him. He's got a... It's not far from where I'm sitting. But usually it's... The opening end is faced towards the table. And he moved the bag around. So the opening end is facing my chair. I didn't realise why he did it. But I noticed that he was just watching me. He likes to just see that I'm there. Which is really cute, isn't it? So he's asleep in his bag. But then he's got his eyes open and he looks. And I actually caught him. I was watching telly and I looked down. And he was just peeking at me. He had his head just like... He was still in the bag. I could see his little nose poking out. But he see his eyes just looking up at me. So I think he just likes to... He likes me to be there. Which is ah, just really nice. It's strange, but it is lovely. It's a lovely thing, really. It's not strange, really, is it? It's just lovely. Or is it strange? <laughs> Maybe it is strange. It just makes me feel a bit, a little bit guilty of putting him in his cage at night, or when I'm in bed, because the cage is in a different room to my bedroom. But I know that if I don't, he'll just be hassling me. Because he'll sleep for a few hours and then he'll get up and he'll want to play and he'll be all over me and nibbling on my fingers and licking my face and just trying to wake me up so that I, I don't know what he wanted me to do, whatever he wants. Probably take him out. And he's moved his little head so he can hear better always listening he knows when I'm talking about him but he's decided just to stay in the bag so he's not getting out he just seems quite happy just laying there at this time of night normally he doesn't bother moving about much it's 2.48 in the morning and he generally apart from getting up to go to the toilet and that's about it and he usually does that in his sleep as well he looks so cute right now it makes me almost forget some of the things he gets up to he's so naughty sometimes The other day, I was just lay, sitting on a chair, and he jumped up, jumped up my legs, ran up my legs, and started biting my hand, quite roughly. To he wanted to play, but he was really playing rough, and I had to tell him off. And I said, Andre. So I don't mind playing rough, I suppose, if I'm in the mood for it. But then he's not always in the mood for it. But it's 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 just he's really rough when he goes for it. I have to keep him away from all dogs now because he bites dogs. Not not aggressively, just plays. It's him playing. He'll bite them, and 
you know, he squared up to a cat the other day because a cat thought that he was going to, like, pounce on him or something. But a cat has only got one chance against him. If a cat can catch him without him seeing it, then yeah, but... He's a vicious little thing. He's a bit like Scrappy-Doo, you know, from uh, Scooby-Doo. He just you know, he won't back down. He'll take on a polar bear if, if he had to. He's got no concept of size. Really hasn't. He's beautiful. He's my little boy. <laughs> anyway, not come on here just to talk about him. Although I could probably talk about him for hours. Some of the weird things that he's done. <clears throat> so what I thought I would do today, just to remind you that as well as the website, letmeboreyoutosleep.com, I also have a special Facebook page, which I really should put the page, the link on the website, but eventually I'll, I'll get it all done eventually it's a bit of a juggling act with all the different websites and the different podcasts and you know but so I've got a specific Facebook channel or page for the let me bore you to sleep and there's not many people joined it yet or liked the page yet uh, about seven I think so it's only been it's been there for a couple of weeks but if you want to you can you know like that page just put in let me bore you to sleep in Facebook search and it'll come up and I post all of my let me bore you to sleep sessions on there so that you can link to the podcast it just makes it a little bit easier if you're perhaps if you're not into any of the other stuff that I do uh then you know it gets you straight to what you want but you can join the other Facebook page that I've got and I'll put all of my stuff on there you know every single session I do is posted on there but you know anyway this is up to you and if you want to help to help me to pay for this free service you can make a donation to paypal.me forward slash Jason Newland that link is on the website so what I thought I would do well, firstly I am uh, I've been asked to go to America to this is quite a while back now I've just got to be last year um, but it's it's progressing so I was asked to go to America to do a couple of talks to some students about hypnosis and I guess my take on hypnosis and how it could help the students who are training at university to help people that have had strokes and uh, asphasia so the with you know having speech uh, issues and um how hypnosis may be useful in their practice and perhaps how it might be able to uh, be used for the patients and i've been thinking about this actually and I haven't said this to uh, my friend who's invited me, but I saw this news article, and it's it's a thing that's been going on for quite a while in England about doctors and doctor surgeries and doctors, GPs, general practitioners. Um, retiring early and leaving and getting ill and stuff because of the pressures of the job 
and I'm not going to go into details because some of it's quite uh, not very nice really not very nice but um, the you know, I found out that a doctor that I used to have is is no longer here when I was I had a doctor I had when I was like a you know quite a young man um, Dr. Bennett his name was and he was in my like childhood home where I used, didn't live with me but he was you know, <laughs> he had a room in the attic no he didn't he anyway so that kind of it touched me a bit it kind of made me think about that and I sometimes think about doctors sometimes when I go and visit my doctor and I've had four doctors leave my surgery since I've been there for 12 years four doctors have left and I don't even have a doctor allocated anymore it's just whoever is available to be see me and I've seen some changes and I must admit that sometimes I've been in the doctors and I've really not even thought of them as humans um, because I've been so focused on my own um, maybe illness at the time and I didn't perhaps it's not that I didn't give them respect because I've always, I always do give doctors respect show respect to them but I perhaps didn't see their potential vulnerabilities there is a part of me that thinks that doctors are superhuman and I still I still feel that even though you know realistically they're not you know the reality is they're human beings but I class doctors as being superheroes and I always have I class paramedics as superheroes uh fire the fire service um people that you know doctors certain nurses people that safe that just do that just it's superhuman isn't it helping someone day in day out saving lives um for me that is superhuman I'm not saying that if I was allowed to have a superhuman power, I'd still choose to fly, I think. Or actually, invisibility would probably be the one I'd want. Or super strength. Yes, yeah, super strength. Um, probably not suit, yes, yeah, flying. It just, <laughs> it just reminds me of a film that I saw years and years ago. And there was a superhero that he flew but he didn't fly more than three foot off the ground because he was scared of heights. <laughs> That's real, it was in a real film. Um, <laughs> so I don't know about flying, but superhuman strength appeals to me, where, you know, kind of an impenetrable body, so, you know, kind of... Uh, you know bullets bounce off you and stuff like that and um, well a bullet would bounce off you unless it's shot by a gun I suppose if it's just someone just held a bullet at you it would bounce off especially my belly unless it was flicked by someone with superhuman strength but yeah I'd invisibility I think about that and I think you know what there's a few few things come to mind when I think about having the power of invisibility I think when I was younger it was more a case of what mischief could get up to really it really was you know a case of that and then as I got older and I reached my 40s maybe 30s even late 30s 
I started to realise that I was gradually becoming more and more invisible, especially to young women. And I practically am invisible to anyone under the age of 40. <laughs> and he, I'm just, so if I keep going, by the time I get to 90, I should be able to be invisible to pretty much everybody. So I got my wish. And it wasn't quite, it's not quite as enjoyable as I thought it would be. Because the ironic thing about it is they can't see you until you're doing something mischief or mischievous. That's when everyone can see you. But before that, you're invisible. And as soon as I do something a little bit mischievous, the whole world can see me. So yeah, that's why it's not the best superpower. I wonder why other superpowers would be good. The thing is, I used to, you know, there's a whole thing about, well, if I had a superpower, I would, and I was like, like Superman, and I could do anything. I'd rid the world of nuclear weapons, and that'd be brilliant, but that's what he did in Superman 4, and that was a really, really bad film. You know? I think it was, what, The Quest for Peace, Superman 4, and that was... Off, well, I don't want to say awful, but it, it, it was. It was really not, not. It didn't. F yeah, it didn't didn't go anywhere close to the first three. I think it maybe part of it was because he got rid of all the nuclear weapons and put them into space in a three minute clip. You know what I mean? There was like a three minute bit where he was just, you saw him putting them into space and putting a big net around them or something. I was like, that's worthy of a whole film, isn't it? Ridding the world of nuclear weapons. I mean, if you think about it, in the first Superman film, the main part of that film was having two nuclear weapons being being detonated and being put sent, you know, from uh, what's his name? Not Dick Turpin. You know his, uh, his enemy in the film, Superman's enemy. Not Clark Kent. That's the... Um, Obviously, that, that's him when he's not got his costume on because he looks a lot different, doesn't he? You know, when he's wearing those glasses. Looks so different. The thing is, he actually does look quite different. But in the same way, I think they did something to him because when he did have... So they had a different hairstyle, didn't he, when he was Superman compared to when he had his suit on as a newspaper reporter. Yeah. Lewis Lane, who was, I forget, Lex Luthor, that's it, Lex Luthor. So Lex Luthor, in the first film, it was all about it was you know the beginning and you know that bit but then once the film he was an adult and he was Superman you know that's seven hours in he the main bit of the film really was just the the, the nuclear missiles being launched and he could only get one couldn't he and then the other one went and it caused all this I don't I think yeah did it? I think so. Anyway, something like that. And uh, and then he zips around the world, doesn't he? And reverses time or whatever. But in the fourth film, he basically does like a million times that in three minutes. I mean, to collect all the nuclear missiles from every single country 
not just the ones that are officially that we know about but you know the, not I mean countries but I mean the I mean they're everywhere and I'm sure there's you could basically get the recipe probably on the internet the, the recipe it's like making a cake so um but you just need a big kitchen so yeah well, I, I kind of put off watching Superman 4 I don't mean I like had it there on the wall all excited thinking oh, had it on a shelf I'm going to watch that one day I'll watch it today no I'll put it off I'll watch it tomorrow no I'll surprise myself I'll watch it Saturday you know they like wrap it up and give it to myself every Christmas for a, a present a surprise present although what I was thinking of doing because I'm single and not alone because I've got Andre obviously so I've got my little boy because it's me and him what I was thinking of doing is maybe buying every week getting a little gift for myself and maybe something for him and then wrapping them up and sticking them in storage not in, I don't want to rent storage but just stick them in the cupboard and then on Christmas and I get myself a Christmas tree and stick in December the 1st of December I'm going to I am I'm going to get all this place nice and decorated and I'll put all those presents under the tree I have a proper Christmas I've never had a proper Christmas on my own where I've made a bit of effort once I did put some uh, decorations up once but I'm going to do it a little bit better this year I'm going to this Christmas I'm going to have a proper proper Christmas I might even invite some family up to visit and give them Christmas presents and stuff that would be good wouldn't it because that means I don't have to visit them I mean travel wise I'm not I've not been great with travelling if I'm honest but but that would be so cool and I can buy books because I want to get books I want to get more hypnosis books and something I'm really into at the moment is and I, I don't know I mentioned it but Bob Bob Proctor I want to get every book that he's written and read them. I am in love with Bob Proctor. He is such a great speaker. He's... I think anyone that can be still saying the same thing after 50 years is someone that you can trust. You know, obviously not if they're like a Nazi or something, but I mean, if 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 they've got like a, a good message to pass on, like he talks, it's a lot about positivity, a lot about self-talk, thing called that he calls the paradigm, and he's it's all about um, how we think. It's not just about positive thinking. It's it's much more than that. It's it, you know it's I, well, I'm not going to go into it, but uh, it's something that I've been trying to do for twenty years. To be fair, and so I try and pass it on within my recordings. Not all of them, obviously, because some of them are a bit silly, but not some of my recordings of me not what he says but it's like everything he says any every word that comes out of his mouth is like yeah I agree with that and that's what I found with Buddhism when I read what the Buddha had to say I'm not I'm not trying to get into religion here because I don't class it as a religion I class it as very amazingly wise words that's that's kind of how I um, take the Buddhist scripture 
as well as any other religious scriptures and uh, words and paragraphs and verses, whatever you want to call it. There's some pretty amazing stuff there, as well as what you get in a a book written by a philosophist or philosophist, philosophy, philos, philosophist, philosophist, philosopher, philosoph. Falofi, falofa, falos, philosophist, philos. That doesn't sound right. Philosophy. Yeah, philosophist, philosophist, philo, philosophy. So philosophy, philosophist. Doesn't sound right, though, does it? Philosophist, psychologist, psychotherapist, philosophist philosophist yeah or a poet or a singer or you know there's plenty of like songwriters that have written stuff that's like wow Bob Dylan was one of my favourites um, and Bob the Builder they're my two favourite Bobs both had a lot of like really great things to say and uh yeah, Bob, Bob's definitely one of my, let's face it, he helped win an American election, Bob the Builder, can we fix it, yes we can, yes we can, yes we, you know it's like wow, I couldn't believe it, when President what's his name, um, was using that slogan yes we can it's like that's Bob the Builder it's like wow so yeah I'd I like reading or hearing I like listening to audios although I do I do have a tendency to fall asleep though Seriously, I'm pretty sure I could listen to, like, I don't know, a war scene or, you know, like, Gladiator. I could watch Gladiator and be awake, but if I listened to the audio, I'd probably fall asleep. You know, Gladiator, the film. You know, even as a car chase and fireworks, I'd probably <laughs> still fall asleep. Something about listening to stuff that I just like, uh, I just like drift off. But then it relaxes me. I find it very relaxing to listen to something, to listen to someone talking, to listen to two people talking. Um, I suppose technically most conversations do have two people, but my conversation is <laughs> just have one it's like a monologue that never ends and has no beginning and has no point to it maybe but there's no I mean, I, it's not going to surprise anyone that I don't rehearse this stuff you know I think it's obvious that I'm not spending all day for 10 hours rehearsing what I'm going to say when I actually press the record button I think it's kind of plain to see that I'm just talking off the top of my head or whatever I feel like talking about but that's the wonder of this however I also do that when I make hypnosis sessions and some of those sessions are pretty good I know I'm perhaps not supposed to suck my own trumpet or whatever but I, I can't help it I just some some of them are good some of them I'm not sure because it's down to the down to the individual isn't it but sometimes I think the ones that I find good um, 
not necessarily the sleep ones, but if it's a hypnosis session for something, uh, and quite often it is actually the insomnia ones, like the deep sleep whisper hypnosis sessions, I find the flow is really good sometimes, and the words come together and some you know I can feel the techniques that I know to do just happening naturally without any kind of preparation because I don't prepare um oh, is it yeah I want to say it's not because I'm lazy but or not it's not because I'm lazy, not really, because I'm not lazy, although I am sometimes. And it's definitely not because I don't care about what I'm doing, because I do. Sometimes. sometimes. I do, I do care. I wouldn't do it if I didn't. I'm not actually doing this just for the sake of it. Sometimes, sometimes. But... I don't listen back to anything I do, generally. And the when I'm in the flow of sort of like not this, but when I'm doing like a a serious, um, not serious, but you know, a more focused deep sleep whisper hypnosis session, I find myself really getting into it. And it's as if I see the words before they even um, plop out of my mouth. It's just like, ah. Oh. And the connections and the continuations of a sentence and the focus of what I'm intending whilst I'm saying the words. Because I think that's part of why I like to just... Uh, ad lib I suppose you could call it or put trust in yeah let's call it the universe let's to put trust in the universe to or in my own mind to provide me with the words that are necessary for that particular uh, situation and it feels quite nice when I'm, I'm kind of listening to myself as I say it. So when I talk, I listen to my voice as I say it. And I hear my voice exactly the same way as you're hearing my voice. Because I'm tuned into it. Because I've been doing it so long. I know how I sound. Completely. Uh, it's not... I'm not saying it's a skill, it's just something that I've learned that's happened naturally. I know exactly how I sound. So I can change it. And I think it's, maybe it's a little bit like that for singers. They know how they sound. You've got to know how you sound as a singer in order to change it whilst you're singing. To adapt to you know, correct or whatever you may need to do tuning wise and isn't it so funny I say all this and one day I'm going to listen to myself and be surprised that I sound like Donald Duck or something and all this time I've been lying to myself that I sound like Mickey Mouse you know what I discovered the other day? Disney. It might not be Disney, but a certain cartoon has been lying to me for years. Woody Woodpecker. Now, I watched a documentary the other day, and it was on... It wasn't on Woodpeckers, but it it contained woodpeckers it was 
it was part of the it was like a the Amundsen rainforest or something like that and, and it involved the trees and the birds and they focused on woodpeckers for a little bit of the programme now I'm not going to be silly and say at no point did it go like that you know um, wasn't that the woodpecker yeah I think that was woodpecker wasn't it Woody Woodpecker and at no point did it you know chip its name into the into the tree but woodpeckers don't go as quickly as Woody Woodpecker did it's like one big chop and a big bit of the tree, well not a big bit, but a big, you know, chunk of wood shoots out. I mean that's not she doesn't shoot out. It sounds like some kind of weird Yeah, anyway, it's just uh some kind of forest video that you'd see online. Nothing shot out anyway, it's it's they're proper, proper strong beaks. It's amazing, really, to watch. I mean, they really are. I mean, that's why they're called woodpeckers, isn't it? But they don't move as fast as the woody woodpecker. Now, the woody woodpecker was moving, what was it? You gotta be it's gotta be at least ten ten pecks a second. Yeah, it's gotta be. But these woodpeckers were doing maybe one peck every five seconds. Or maybe three or four seconds. It was proper like it's like a I suppose I imagine it was a lot of effort put into that one peck and I was still impressed by it I was still impressed by the by um, you know the woodpecker but it wasn't the same and I think to myself why um, why why not why not make a proper cartoon about a proper woodpecker? Why make up, you know, giving it super powers when uh, the woodpecker is already pretty much super, super already? It's like that super strength. I mean, if that woodpecker was the size of a bear. Yeah, it'd be able to knock a tree down in one swipe. It'd be able to just go, whoosh, and it'd cut right through the tree. Which then got me thinking about genetics. No, it didn't. It has now, though. And it would have to be some kind of uh, kind of experiment because. I don't think nature's gonna it's not gonna happen naturally is it I would <laughs> a woodpecker and a bear I mean I don't think it's a case of they're just different living live in different lifestyles and they never get to meet I think it's probably more to it than that you know I don't think it's a case of just well if we give them get them to go to have the same interest or we'll put on like a little dating a dating club, you know, and send an invitation to both of them, and maybe they'll hit it off. No, I think anatomically, yeah, I think it would be a, yeah, I don't think it would work, but 
with genetic stuff they can do they can pretty much mix anything together uh, so uh, mind you it might end up the other way around mightn't it it might be a woodpecker yeah it might be a, a bear the size of a woodpecker but then that's kind of be like a small koala bear wouldn't it Hmm. So today I got on the bus and uh, I wasn't, I needed to go out, I didn't want to go out and it's raining. I didn't want to go out, but I needed to. And what's weird is I could hear the rain and I thought it's the overflow, because, well not the overflow, but the guttering gets too full and it just drips down and I can hear that dripping and I was looking out my window of the living room and I couldn't see no rain I just thought I wasn't looking out of it I didn't have the window open and I was the other side of the room I wasn't I was wearing binoculars or you know who wears binoculars but you know what I mean I, I just couldn't see any rain so I thought hmm and then my friend knocked on the door and he said oh it's raining I said yeah I know but I think it's mainly just the gutter in now though the, the gutter is dripping he said no I said no I think it is he said no I said no I actually do think that's what it is I the gutter overflows on the back and the front of the of the building. He said, "No, no, 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 no." I said, "Why? Why are you? Why are you saying no, no, no continuously?" He said, "I don't know." Anyway, he we went out the front door, and uh, the gutter was leaking or overflowing. But it was also raining. So I kind of think that's a a win-win. You know, we're both right, weren't we, really? I would say. So I took that as a... We decided not to have a... Have a duel. You know, to kind of figure out who was the winner. We just decided, just, okay, it's fine. And I thought... Oh, so I needed to go to get to the chemist, although it's called a pharmacy now, but it didn't used to get called a pharmacy, it used to be called a chemist. And now for some reason we call it a pharmacy. And I don't really know why. I know it's it's where you get pharmaceuticals. Yeah, but it used to be called a chemist. That's why I um the snicker bar. I'm still not impressed with that change. It's a marathon. Now I don't know if in other countries you ever had a different name for the snicker bar. But in England it used to be called marathon. You know like the running thing. You know thing that people think it's a really good idea to do in sort of well April when they're watching it or whatever month you have, your marathon is in and then they train and then on the day it comes they regret <laughs> it's like oh my goodness especially the ones that come dressed as dinosaurs and stuff like that so I had this thinking I thought should I go to town I thought no I'm not going to town that wasn't even what I thought about why are you telling people you think about that when you weren't and I was like I don't know why I just it came out I told you I don't rehearse any of this so yeah but just try and stick to the 
stick to the idea that you had like a few seconds ago. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. I'm back. And I mean, snick. Why call it a snick? The only reason they called it a snick bar here is because they wanted, as far as I know, it was called a snick bar in America. And maybe it was never called a marathon anywhere else. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it used to be. Maybe you just let me know. Um, and. Why not just keep it called a marathon? They've done that with a few things. Changed the name. What else is it they change? They, whoever they are, the product provider, the manufacturer of said product. They changed the name of. Here's a bit of information that's very boring, but it's, it's something that you may not know and you're not going to care about. The comedian Harry Hill, and if you've never heard of him, if you're in a different part of the world that doesn't know who he is, if you're in England, you're going to know who he is because he's a famous comedian. But if you haven't, if you don't know, just Google his name, Harry Hill. It's very funny, very funny. And his name used to be Harry Hall when he first started doing comedy in probably 1990 or 91, probably 1990. And then I think in about 1992 or 1993, one of them, before he got famous, it was a big spread in Time Out magazine. Not a big spread, but a big advert in Time Out magazine where all the the listings for London were. So every comedy club would be in there. So it was basically to let all the promoters and the audience know. So basically it said, um, from now onwards... Harry Hall will be known as Harry Hill. And then it said he's changed his name due to someone else being called Harry Hill in the entertainment industry. No, someone else being called Harry Hall. So his name was changed to Harry Hill. That's that's the whole story. I used to know Harry Hill. Not like knowing to kind of you know I didn't go around his house for dinner or to play charades or anything like that but he he was a comedian well he still is a comedian obviously but he was he was one of these comedians that was a headliner for all the big comedy nightclubs the comedy clubs so he'd be like the star of the show, but he'd also do little clubs, like really little clubs, not just, you know, he'd do gigs where it was a door split and he'd end up with like six pound. And then he'd do the comedy store where he'd get paid, I don't know, 300 pound for a set or 400 pound or, you know, whatever. So he'd really, and this was the early 90s, because he wanted just to get on stage and try out new material, and he took every single gig, which meant I was also in that position, and I took every single gig, but the only ones offered to me were the really, really small ones, where there was, well, usually I wasn't getting paid anything. So I kind of got to know him. And he's a really nice bloke. But I said, I didn't sort of get to know him well, but I, I met him loads and loads of times. And I remember advice he gave me once. He said, uh, I said to him, what? You see me, 
you know, probably 20, 30 times on stage. And he said, yeah. I said, have you got any advice? Because obviously you're doing really well and you've you got a radio show and you're probably going to be on TV at some point. And, you know, what, have you got any advice? He said, yeah, I suppose. I said, uh, what, what advice would you give me? He said, quit. I was like, oh, okay. I thought he was joking enough, you know, it made me laugh and then he was called and he went on stage and you know, I didn't see him after that, but. It's good to get advice though, isn't it? It's, it's good to have those memories. Remember another one, um, Alan Davis. He's another comedian, he's very famous in England and I did a gig with him, I did a comedy gig with him. He was headlining of course, because he was already like one of the top comedians in the country, or in London anyway at that time. And I did a <laughs> I did a gig with him and it was I said to him before I went on stage we were in the back talking and I said to him if this gig don't go well I'm just going to quit so I went on stage and everything like that I didn't see didn't see Alan Davis for probably six months and we were again in the back back room of a, a different club and um, I said, all right, Alan. He said, oh, all right. He said to me, I, I thought you were going to quit. I was like, I thought, part of me thinking, well, that's rude. Because the gig didn't go that bad. It didn't go great, but it wasn't that bad, you know. But part of me thought, he remembers me. Which is quite nice, because he was a big star that was before he was on telly and he went on to do lots of stuff but he's if you look at his what did he do that TV show where he's a magician and he's brilliant he's, he's a lovely bloke but yeah it's just even though it was kind of he was just making fun of me it was just like he remembers me I used to be friends, well, I, th I used to follow Mark Thomas around. So Mark Thomas is another brilliant comedian. And I was not obsessed with him, but I was just really, because the kind of comedy I did was rude. I was very rude. And I wanted to be like Mark Thomas. But no one realised that. I wanted to, I wanted to be, Maybe not as political, but I just wanted to be as great as he was, as funny as he was, and as, as, um, but just brilliant. I just, I just thought he was brilliant. Absolutely loved the bloke. Um, he's the kind of person I see him when I was in the comedy club. I remember he came in once, and it was a, I think it was a charity gig, and he turns up. It's in the summer. And he turns up in shorts, a t-shirt, and pretty little little backpack. He's obviously been out for the day somewhere, and he's just turned up. Did the gig, said hello to me. Did his, did the, did the gig, said hello to other people as well. Went on stage, did his twenty minutes or whatever, and then headed off home. And. It's like there was no nerves. There was no... It's like he just did it off the top of his head. Um, which he, I'm sure he didn't, you know, in the sense of he's, he's a brilliant writer and I'm sure he, he kind of knew what he was going to be saying, but it just blew me away. It's like, wow. And that was years after I kind of... Fell in, I didn't fall in love with him romantically, but I just, 
I just fell in love with his act in his uh, his attitude and his ability and wanted to be like him and I actually had his telephone number he gave me his number which was a mistake and uh, he put me on the door a few times so I could go and visit him not visit him but go and see him perform at some of the bigger clubs so I could get in for free but then I didn't want to sort of take advantage of that um, but I did find a nice tree that was quite high up that uh, overlooked his living room so I kind of kept in contact that way from a distance you know because I thought it would be a bit weird to keep phoning him so I'd do something a bit less weird but he's you know he's, he's a great 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 comedian and uh what other comedians do I really, really like? Like in England, I mean, there's lots of in America. I was really big in American comedians before. Before I got involved in the London comedy circuit, I only really knew American comedians, other than the the English ones that I'd seen on telly. And I think the only real, not the real, but the only kind of alternative stand-up comedians that I'd seen English ones was on a thing there's a program called Friday Night Live that used to be on in probably about 1988 87, 88 which was a couple of years before I kind of got involved in the comedy scene so I, I kind of saw a few or maybe it was 86, I can't remember. But anyway, it was, I think Joe Brand was one of the only comedians that I saw on there. Jim Taveray as well. Um, both who I met and got to know a little bit. And see, I was all excited to meet Joe Brand. And she's by far the most famous female comedian not but you could say just comedian but definitely the most famous female comedian in the country like stand up but she's one of the most famous comedians full stop because she's been around for absolutely ages long before most of the comedians that are around now she's been around what 30 30 odd years over 30 years on stage and I met her in 1991 and we were sitting at the bar we used to have these there used to be these chairs and sofa and stuff near the bar at this comedy club I used to go in and she'd be sitting there and she was really friendly to me but I just used to annoy her I think maybe I was trying to make her laugh or trying to be funny or something but she just stopped talking to me because I upset her I said something that she didn't like and kind of yeah <laughs> which happened quite a lot in them days but I don't know what it was I said something silly it was just it wasn't meant to it was just meant to make her laugh it wasn't supposed to cause a trauma but um, and her boyfriend I really got on well with her boyfriend and I think they they split um, I shouldn't I mean I, I don't know but I think I don't know I think because she's married so I don't know if they're still together but his his name was Jim and he was really friendly and he's really really good comedian really really good and he was a headliner and I remember I, so I'd known him for quite a few years and he said to me one night I'm quitting and I said what? I thought he was joking to me and this was like a Saturday night you know probably early hours in the morning we were just sitting around standing around drinking at the bar and he said, yeah, I'm quitting. I said, what? what do you mean you're quitting? How can you quit? 
you're a brilliant comedian you used to be really good looking as well so I imagine it's only a matter of time before TV would want to grab him and stick him on in front of the camera but he was really brilliant writer he wrote for other people and it was just really you know and he said no the reason I said why are you quitting he said because I'm never going to be the best so what do you mean? He said, I'm never going to be the best comedian. So I'm just going to write for other comedians from now on. You know, I've never, ever, ever heard anyone ever say that. Ever. Before or since. That they're going to stop, you know, what they're doing because they're never going to be the best. And I kind of was sad but I, I kind of respected it at the same time. But then I thought, well, what about me? You know, I've, it took me two years to, well, not two years, but it took, it took a few months before I got my first laugh of going on stage. And it took me three years before I started being taken a little bit seriously and getting paid gigs. But he was already up there with, you know, headlining like Harry Hill and Lee Evans and all that. You know, he was already uh, at the top of his game, like in London, on the comedy circuit. And and he did. He, he stopped performing. And he carried on writing for other big stars that went on to be famous you know on television and stuff like that so he probably earned a lot of money doing it and probably has but I, just, I couldn't believe like what you know how can you just stop doing something that you're so good at because it wasn't just the jokes it was his performance as well he was so confident when he was on there it's a little bit like um Mark Lamar uh, performing on stage is live see Mark Lamar I don't know if he did I'm sure he did a live live in concert video I need to look up that one of the best stand up comedians I've ever seen throughout my whole time that I, and I've seen thousands of performances thousands over the 20 year period that I was, you know, involved. And he, I saw him once and he was in a gig at Clapham Common. And the comedy club, I'm sure it was called the Clapham something. Um, down at the Clapham Common or something like that. And it was a big room, big probably held over 200 maybe 300 people maybe more it was a big big room and was it the black not, not the black cat but anyway it was down at the common I feel it was sort of something to do with Clapham but it was at Clapham Common anyway and he came in and I was performing there as well I think that night doing like a free bit a free spot and he came in and he'd just been to see a concert by what's his name the rapper he was like can't touch this do 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 that that rapper and he'd been to see him in I think at Wembley a stadium or whatever and he just came in and he was talking about it talking about the concert before he kind of went on stage so he went on stage and he just talked about the concert and it was really hilarious what he was saying but then he stopped talking and he looked down at somebody that was sitting on a sitting at a table in front of him you know one of the audience members 
and he managed to get about 10 minutes material out of that person who was looking at the table because they were sitting there looking at the table instead of looking at him he managed to gain 10 minutes of material out of that which was absolutely hilarious that's that kind of comedy mind is just pure gold that's just like wow and yeah it was just it's, I don't think about this stuff very often, but I just kind of come, just came to me. It's absolutely amazing to see something like that. You know, uh, a comedy routine, which was, you know, a hundred times better than mine. Just that that came out of nothing. And mind that I'd spent years trying to put together. And he was, you know, a hundred times better than me. Just in that ten minutes of unrehearsed material. Which had just come to him in that moment. I was like, oh, I wish I could be like that. But yeah, he was... I'll have to look online to see whether or not he's... He's got a stand-up... Uh, video on YouTube because he was one of the best stand-ups that I've seen that I ever saw he was so good he was so smart and he was he'd go on stage and he was dressed in a suit and he'd, he had his hair greased back and he was this handsome young man and he had a bit of a potty mouth because he was swearing and stuff but he was so funny so clever um, that's Mark Lamar so again I've gone over time talking about a bunch of stuff Andre's just done a big toilet on the paper which is lovely and uh, used the carpet as toilet paper as he usually does which is grim 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 but I'm going to go and I wish you have a lovely sleep and if you're still awake and you're just listening to this for a bit of company or something to do thank you thank you for listening and I hope that I have been a little bit of company and I know that I go off on in different directions and perhaps don't stick to the topic that I first began with. But that's kind of part of the part of the fun. So take care of yourselves and remember that you deserve to be happy. You deserve to have a good sleep and to feel relaxed. I shall speak to you tomorrow.